Okay, so let's finish up. I'm Parsha Sav. We were talking about, uh, the last time we were talking about the Kohen Godel bringing his korban, uh, which he brings uh, uh, a half of each korban every day. And then we're going on in Per uh, Gvav Pasuk Yud Ches. So the Torah says like this, uh, uh, page 5, three lines of the Tav. Speak to Aaron and his son. Zos Torah Sachatos. This is the, uh, the law of the Chatos, which is the sin offering. Where you shech the ola in the north part of the of the uh, azora, uh, Rashi says, um, 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 Rashi doesn't say it over here. Okay, it's on the north part of the of the azora. Now uh, the commentaries point out over here. Why does the Torah do this? Why does the Torah say, well, the Torah takes pains to tell you, and the, each korban had an area where it was offered, sacrifice where it was dealt with. Why do they shech the chatas in the same place as they shech the olot? So the idea is like this. A korban olot, the burnt offering, is something that you could pledge anytime you want. Anytime you want, you could pledge a burnt offering. You feel that you neglected to do a positive command, like let's say you didn't hear the Megillah, uh, 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 or, or you forget you failed to put on tefillin, or you had inappropriate thoughts, but it's not mandatory. Now, remember we spoke about that. Then Ola isn't mandatory. So you bring a Korban Ola, you're pledging it, you're really making a, a, a voluntary contribution. Achatas is worse. Achatas means you did an Avera, which had you done it intentionally, with witnesses, it's the death penalty. Hmm. In many cases, without witnesses, or sometimes even with, with the, it's the kares penalty, it's premature death. For instance, let's say a person ate chelev. Chelev is the forbidden fat from a kosher animal. Right. Forbidden fat from a kosher animal. Okay, it's not a death penalty, but it's a kares penalty. It's premature death. Bazin doesn't execute for it, but a person is liable for premature death, which is generally considered death before the age of 60. Now, uh, 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 if a person, what happens if it happened unintentionally? So unintentionally, you bring a korban chatas. If you did it by incidentally, the, the tshuva for it is only if you did it unintentionally. If you did it intentionally, you can't bring a chatas. You don't deserve, you don't deserve, it's like somebody, somebody who, 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 let's say you hurt your wife's feelings unintentionally, right, which is basically every day, right? <laughs> so then it, it's basically every day and everything you say, right? So, so then you can get away by bringing her, you bring her some flowers, a box of chocolate, you get away. But what happens when you insult her intentionally? You, know, you really get, you really, uh, you, you really, uh, then flowers and chocolate ain't gonna do it. You know, you're, you're, you're in the doghouse for a while until you, until you finally f figure out some way to make amends, right? And, and you show that you've done true. So chatas, you have to deserve, in other words, the severity of the Avera reduces your chance for doing such a quick tshuva. By the way, gentlemen, if you ever heard, if you ever, if you ever get in a fight with somebody, you ever have it out with somebody, and you feel you want to apologize, or you deserve to apologize, you, you, you should apologize to somebody, anybody, it doesn't have to be a spouse, anybody you have to apologize, you wronged somebody. When you apologize, an apology is cheap. You should feel the sting a little bit, buy him something. You, 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 you wronged somebody, you did something wrong to somebody, buy him a safer. Buy him something, take him out for a meal. Make sure, let it cost you a little bit. Then that'll show that you're really contrite. That's the way to, that's the way to show that, that, that let, let it hurt. Um, so, so here the Torah says, you bring the chatas because you did, you did something wrong. Now, why is it that the chatas is done in the same place as the ola? Why is the chatas done in the north part of the, of the, of the north part of the, of the azara, of the sanctuary? That's where they shech the chatas. That's what the Torah says. So, um, the, 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 uh, the, 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 so you go to the base of Migdash, if you're standing there with your offering in the north side of the in the north side of the of the sanctuary, everybody knows, ha ha, okay, what did he mess up on? What was the light switch on Shabbos this time? Was it the, uh, the forbidden fast? Well, everybody knows you're a sinner. Therefore, out of sensitivity to the sinner, so we shouldn't know, we shouldn't know uh, uh, that necessarily that he's a sinner, uh, even though one is a male and one is a female. But nobody's inspecting them that closely. One is a male animal, one's a female animal. Nobody's inspecting that closely, and therefore at least, at least to, to help them save face. Now, uh, 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 it's from here that we learn that the silent, that the Shmonesri is done silently, uh, so as not to embarrass the sinners if they're confessing their sins during Shmonesri. And that's also on Yom Kippur, when you confess your sins, you do it silently. 
You don't do confession out loud, unless they're the generic ones. You know, Asham, Nu Bagad, Nu Gazal, Nu, which we do out loud uh, in, in, the, in the Shemana Esri. But anything other than that, when you do your, with your, own, your own confession, uh, uh, there's, uh, you do it silently, number one. Number two, in Judaism, you do not talk about your past sins. You do not talk about past misdeeds. Because if you talk about it, 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 you know, there's something that you've done in life. Let's say you did something in life which you're really embarrassed about. There's something that not, 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 not teenage embarrassed where you're, where you're actually proud of it. You know, where, where you're really embarrassed about something, where you've really taken a downer. You took one on the jaw. Most people don't talk about it. Most people don't talk about the worst thing that happened to them. You, you want to hide it. The fact that you're talking about it means that you're not really embarrassed about it. Otherwise, nobody walks around trying to embarrass themselves. So the idea of talking about Navera means you know, so we do not publicize our past misdeeds. We're supposed to, it's supposed to be the, farthest, the last thing I want to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. The only time you'd be allowed to do it is if you want to know how to do tshuva for it. So then you go to a, a rabbinic authority or, or, or somebody who's going to mentor or somebody who you want to get, you want to do tshuva, and therefore you ask them, what do I know? What do I need to do? The Noda Yehuda, for example, uh, the Noda Yehuda who was... Uh, 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 one of the great halachic authorities at the time of the Vilna Gaon, Rabbi Yecheskel Landau. So he has uh, people who write to him and they ask him, how do I do tshuva, a man who committed adultery unknowingly? Uh, he didn't, they didn't know the woman was married or whatever, and he wants to know how to do, how do I do tshuva for such a thing? Rabbi Moshe Feinstein has a series of, of, of responses of people who know a guy, a guy's done various haveras, a girl's done haveras, how do I do tshuva for these things? That you're allowed to do because you, you're, you're allowed to disclose it. Otherwise, sit around with your friends and talk about, oh yeah, remember we ate pork? That means it doesn't really bother you. If it really bothered you, if it really bothered you, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be talking about it, okay? So that's why the chatos is done by the yashem. Okay, now, by, by, in the same place as the Ola. Now, take a look at, at uh, uh, Perik, Perik uh, Zayin Posig Yud Beis. A very interesting, uh, uh, we, we, I think we've mentioned this in the past. Uh, Perik Zayin Posig Yud Beis is on page 574. Vizos Toras Zebach HaShlomim Asher Yakriv LaHashem. A shlomim is a goodwill offering. Now there are various types of goodwill offerings that a person could bring. Sometimes you just, you're in a good mood. I'm in a good mood, I aced the test. I got a good grade on a test, I decided to pledge a shlomim. And you bring a korban shlomim. Uh, from the word, the root of the word shlomim is obviously what? Shalom, shalom. shalom. Uh, 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 so, so you're gonna bring this korban shlomim. Now, there's the first type he talks about is im al toda yakrivenu. Let's say you bring a thanksgiving offering. Let's say a person says, I pledge. For example, a person says, I pledge a korban toda. It's a form of shlomim, and you're giving thanks. Now, a toda is recommended, again, not mandatory, but it is recommended to bring a korban toda when a person has gotten out of a life-threatening situation. The Rashi Tevos is chayim, life. He was either ill, or he crossed the sea, or he crossed the desert, or he, crossed, or he got out of prison. And one of these situations, he was in a life-threatening situation, he got out of a life-threatening situation, you bring a carbon toda. Incidentally, uh, you know that when a person's been in a life-threatening life situation, they make a bracha birkas ha gomel, the bench gomel. Now, when people say the bench gomel, first of all, the custom is to do it by, the, by a Torah, uh, but, but you don't have to do it in davening. You can do it any time. Uh, it's supposed to have 10 men around. You should have 10 men around you, a minion, you know, so you could uh, we bench gomel in front of 10 people. Uh, anybody who's been in a life-threatening situation benches gomel. A woman who's given birth has to bench gomel, and there are two ways that they do it. Either the husband benches for her, or in many communities, the woman stands behind the mechitza, they get ten men in shul, she goes behind the mechitza, she makes the bracha out loud, and ten men answer amen. It could be done in her house also, you could bring ten men into the house and she could bench gomel. So, is you, you benching benching is blessing. No, I know, I know that. Gomel Gomel is the bracha. Ha Gomel lechayavim to us that God has be bestowed good on those who are really guilty. Anybody in a in a life who's gone through a life threatening situation. Now the most common form of benching Gomel that you're going to find nowadays somebody who's been in a car accident. And a car accident means he's been in the accident and survived it. Not that he's been in a near miss. If you swerve and just miss hitting somebody, that sort of thing, you don't bench gomel. You miss hitting a truck or going off the cliff, that's not benching gomel. Benching gomel is when a person, maybe, maybe swerving to go off, not, off the cliff is something else. 
Benching Gomel is usually when it's actually happened. It's actually happened to the person. They were in a bad car accident and they survived it. And often you need to ask a halachic authority whether or not that constitutes benching Gomel. I remember hearing a guy, a guy uh, 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 who is not very knowledgeable, so he was sitting on a bus, he, got a, he was in shul and he benched Gomel. So I said to him afterwards, why did he bench Gomel? He says he was on a bus and there was a chafetz chashud. It was a suspicious object. The bus stopped, he goes, I remember the guy said to me, there was a suspicious object. He said, turned out it was okay, but that's close enough for me. Right? So he just made a brachal of atola, because it turns out he was never in a life-threatening situation. Hmm. There, so it's one thing if a bomb, you understand, it was never life-threatening, there was no bomb there. So if there was a bomb there and the bomb detonated and a person survived it, if a person was in the, in the, in the Brussels airport just now, he would bench Gomel. If a person was near a bomb that never detonated, then you can ask a halachic authority, does that constitute close enough? But if there was no bomb at all, just because you thought there was a bomb, you certainly don't. That's a, that, that, that's a brachal of atola. Now, one of the most common times that we make bench gomel is when you travel. Okay, so uh, there are people who don't, because pl especially plane travel, plane travel is safe. It's safer than driving. So, but people, now, why is that? Rabbi Moshe Feinstein says that you make a birkas agoma for plane travel when you've traveled over a body of water. Because the Gomorra, when the Gomorrah talks about benching goma, the Gomorrah talks about a person who has traveled the seas. It's something, it has nothing to do with the plane, it's because you went over a body of water. So if you fly from one place to another in the United States, a six hour flight, you would not make, you would not bench goma. If you fly from here to Cyprus, and you cross a body of water, then you would bench go. It's not because of the flight, it's not the plane, it's the, it's the, it's the water. So that's what you mentioned. Now, korban tota is the same thing. A korban tota is the same thing. A person who uh, has been in a life-threatening situation, they bring a korban tota. Now, pay attention to what he does. Imal tota yakrivenovikiv al zevach tota chalos matzos. He brings uh, loaves of, how does the Arsco translate it? Um, unleavened loaves. Okay, and he's going to end up bringing with his korban toda, with the, the animal that he brings, um, um, he's going to bring um, 40 loaves of bread. He brings 40 loaves of bread. Okay, now, what is the significance? You, you'll see the way the Torah describes it. The Gemara says there that he brings loaves of bread, 40, 30 unleavened, what, 10 of them are leavened. And he brings 40 loaves all together. What is the significance of the number 40 in Judaism? 40 days of what? Mount Sinai. Good. Where else do you find the number 40? 40 days in the desert. 40 years in the desert. 40 days of the flood. 40 days of the flood. Where else? Cows, was it? No. 40 days until the, the embryo is considered a done deal. You could daven, if a woman becomes pregnant, you could daven for the un, unborn embryo to be a male, usually, up till the 40th day. By the 40th day, it's a fait accompli. Okay? Where else do you find number 40? 39 malachas of Shabbos, which are called in the Mishnah 40 minus 1. Interesting. Why? I mean, 40 minus 1, why don't you call it 39? And if you want to be cool about it, why don't you call it 50 minus 11? You know, you know a 40 minus, it's called 40 minus 1. Very interesting. Where else do you find that same phenomenon? Where else? Where else do you find it? A mikveh is 40 sa'a of water. It has to be 40 measures of water. Sa'a is like what we would call a gallon. So probably a little bit more. But it's called 40, to be kosher, it has to have 40 sa'a. A sa'a is a certain liquid measure, 40 sa'as of water. Where else do you find the number 40? When a person is flogged, what's it called in the Torah? Malkus arboim. How many does he get? He gets 39. He gets 39, yet it's called malkus arboim. The Gemara says malkus arboim means they be given the number right before 40. But the Torah refers to it as our boy milkad. You hit him forty times. Yet we have the oral tradition says thirty nine. I mean, how much more? How much more can you change from the written to the oral? It's 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 forty forty minus one. So uh, uh, the idea is like this: the Maharal says that any time you see the number forty, there's an indication of some sort of renewal. The world needs to be renewed. How many days does it rain? Forty days. A child is renewed. 
you get, you get much newer than, a, than an embryo, 40 days. Person goes into a mikvah, what's the whole point of going into the mikvah? Renewing, uh, renewing your attitude, renewing, you become tummy, now you gotta come out a new person. 40, 40 saw. Har Sinai, 40, 40, 40 years in the desert, because the Jewish people need to renew their attitude. They, the decree of 40 days, of 40 years was after the spies. So, uh, you, you're gonna need a 40 year upan now to renew your, your, your attitude. 40 days on Mount Sinai, they're shifting into a new mode of behavior. Everywhere you see the number 40, there's a renewal, okay? Now, that brings us to the two places where it says 40, but it's really 39. What does that mean? What does that mean? It says 40, but it's really 39. Why is that? That's very interesting. What's the point of Shabbos? What's the point of Shabbos? To Shab- rest, take a break. That's one of the ideas of Shabbos. What else are you supposed to do? Recharge, renew your spiritual battery a little bit. You've been, you've, been, you've been immersed in the mundane physical world for an entire week. Let's get a little renewal over here, a little learning, a little davening, a little resting, a little, but renew, recharge the battery, both physical and ruchni. Now, many people feel, listen, Shabbos is a booby trap. It's an obstacle course. This is us, or that's us, or this is us, or... The best thing to do on Shabbos is get into bed for 24 hours. That way you won't do anything wrong. Mm. Right? Okay, so what does the Torah do? The Torah says, listen, we want you to renew yourself. What's the point of the prohibitions on Shabbos? You're not allowed to do creative activity. Why not? Why 40, 39 categories of creative activity? What's wrong with creative activity? Shabbos, 39 categories you can't do. Why not? Why? That's where it's learned from. Why does the Torah prohibit it? Good. It will sidetrack you. You get involved in creative activity, you're going to get sidetracked. That's why if you take a chair and pick it up and down and put it on the table a hundred times, that's not prohibited. How long are you going to do that for? A, if you do it, you got other problems. B, if you, if, you, if, if, if you do it, how long are you going to do it for? But if you start getting involved in painting or in cooking or in doing something, you know, you can really get involved in something that sidetracks you from Shabbos. And Shabbos, we want you to renew yourself. So the Torah calls it, the Mishnah calls it 40 minus 1. Know why? We are creating a playing field for you. The best playing field. I'm making it possible for you to do what Shabbos is for. You know what I'm doing? I'm leveling the playing field for you. You can't get sidetracked by anything else. All you have to do, however, I can't do it for you. That one step you have to take on your own. That's the 40th step. 39 is, it's out of your way. It's right there. I can't walk it for you. You're going to have to do that. I'm leveling out the playing field for you. Now you take the, you finish it off. That's why it's 40 minus 1. Because the goal is the 40. It's minus 1. There are 39 prohibitions. But just abiding by the prohibitions isn't the goal. It's not to avoid, it's not to avoid doing something wrong. It's to be proactive on Shabbos. So it's 39 that are prohibited, now you take the step and you become, what do you call it, you become, you, 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 produ- you become renewed on Shabbos. Okay? Yeah. Oh, so what about the Makos? It's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing by the, by, by the, by the, by the whipping is the exact same thing. What's the whole point of whipping a person? To you did correct some? Them. Correct them. We got to renew your attitude. So what can we do? We'll whip you 39 times. Yeah, but there's a limit to what we can do for you. You're going to have to do something on your own. Now you take the step in the other direction. That's the 40th step. The attitude, again, the goal is the 40. So we'll make it easy for you. We'll whip you 39 times, <laughs> whip some attitude into you, but you're going to have to do something on your own. You take that 40th step. All right, that's the theme that you're going to find by the number 40. Everywhere you see the number 40. So what's happening over here? What's a Corbin Toda? Carbon Toto is a person bringing a sacrifice. He got a new lease on life. He got a new lease on life. He just came out of a life-threatening situation. So what do you do to publicize the miracle? It's a new lease on life. 40 loaves of bread. You go invite people in, and everybody has a, has a, has a, has a, a, a Carbon Toto party, and this is your way of making a public thanks to HaKadosh Baruch for giving you a new lease on life. That's the number 40. Okay? Now, one more point here. Take a look at Pazuch Chavav. Uh, so it says like this, dam lo sochelu, you must not consume any blood. Uh, page 578, five lines from the, five lines from the top. dam lo sochelu, you must not eat any blood. 
for the fowl and for the animals. That means um, uh, 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 you, uh, there's a prohibition to consume blood. Fish blood is permissible, by the way, for those who must. Uh, I don't recommend it. I haven't tasted it. I don't have to taste it to, ne- to recommend against it, though. Uh, but, but you're not allowed to eat any blood. You're not allowed to eat animal blood. You're not allowed to eat bird blood. That's why we salt the meat. You ever seen the meat salted? Uh, they, 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 I haven't seen my mom. I remember growing up seeing my mother salting, salting chickens and, so, and, and koshering liver. You used to kosher the liver, but the liver can't be salted. The liver has to be roasted out. You roast out the blood. Um, the chickens, they used to salt it. You have to take a certain size salt. It can't be too thin. You have the too thin, it'll dissolve. And it can't be too thick, too big, because it won't get to all the crevices. It's got to be a certain type of salt that they salt the chickens inside and out, meat also. And you leave the salt on for about a half hour, and you'll notice the salt after a half hour turns completely red because it draws the blood out. Anything after that amount of time that the halacha says that the salt has to be on there, any red residue is not considered blood. Any red residue afterwards is not considered blood. It's been properly salted. That's the halacha, okay? Now, the Torah says you're not allowed to eat blood. One of the basic ideas behind it is the blood is a life-giving force. Ki hadam hu nefesh, the life, life-giving force. There's a certain lack of... Uh, it's, it's insensitive to eat the essence of the animal. Right? In, in the north of England, they have something called black pudding. You know what black pudding is? Never heard of black pudding? Mm. Black pudding is they take congealed blood. <laughs> they, take, they take blood, they congeal it. They make it into a loaf like salami. You know, they put spices in. Apparently, apparently it tastes good, otherwise they wouldn't eat it. And it's called black pudding. Right? That's what they eat. It's, it's essentially congealed blood. And I guess they spice it up and they make it out. To us, it's absolutely repulsive. It's absolutely for a Jew. The blood is, blood is absolutely repulsive. And uh, they, they, what do you call it? They, uh, uh, um, uh, a guy told me that he was a, a, a sheikhid. Uh, he saw in the slaughterhouse, you know, they shech the animals. There's a lot of blood when they shech the behema. There was one day have nine Jews working there to help manipulate the animal. He said there was a guy there, and they shech the behema. The guy took his cup, and he just filled it up right at the neck. And he knocked it down. He apparently hadn't had his breakfast, and he, uh, he, just, he just knocked it down. Yeah, don't talk until you try it. Apparently, it's got, you know, it's got rich in iron and everything. To us, it's absolutely, absolutely repulsive. So based on that, based on that, you know, even if the Torah told us not to eat blood, by the way, the, 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 the Gemara says that if for not eating blood or bugs, bugs and blood, which are naturally repulsive to us, we are going to be rewarded. So all the more so, imagine the reward for immorality and theft, which are things that we desire. Imagine the reward we're going to get for that. When you pay for kosher chickens or kosher meat, you're paying six times the price of non-kosher meat, uh, you're going to be rewarded for that because part of that is the labor that goes into, in, into koshering it. So that, that's how, how do we fulfill the business of not eating blood? By eating co- meat that's been kosher already. Most of the meat that we get today has been kosher. Most people, you, you, I rarely see people koshering meat in the home. And in the old days, you couldn't get it. The cat factory didn't kosher it for you. You bought the chickens and you koshered it yourself. Nowadays, they're koshered. Say what? Shechted. Yeah, you got the shechted chicken and then you took it home and you koshered it. Yeah, in the old days, uh, people, uh, yes, yes, the, uh, my generation people will still have seen their mothers koshering meat. Some people even kosher it. Some people are very meticulous. They buy the shechted chicken and they kosher it in the house. They don't rely on the mass produced koshering. But, the, but that's, that's how it's done. Okay. So there's a mashgiach watching it. So you're paying for that. You're paying for the koshered meat. Uh, that's one of the reasons why there's an interest for people. Uh, uh, who, who sell kosher meat, why there's a scandal once in a while, they try to substitute and sell non-kosher meat. Uh, because they're, you're, you're going to make a lot more money on it because of non-kosher meat. The best scandal that I ever heard was in Chicago, of course. Uh, the best, there's been a scandal in every city. In every city there's been a scandal. The best one that I ever heard was in Chicago, where there was a guy who had a, two factories. He had a kosher chicken factory and a non-kosher chicken factory. And the kosher chicken factory he had kosher supervision. Now, what the guy did, the way they, the, the way they did it is like this. It's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. The kosher mashgiach would come in, and he had tags that he would put on the chickens. So each chicken was tagged individually. And then six chickens were put into a big bag, and the bag was tagged. 
than the kasha, the people who bought it. You bought the chickens with the tail. And only the mashkiach had it. The guy, the factory owner didn't have it. He was a Jew, but not religious. And he did not have the tags. So then one day the guy got an idea. He's got a non-kosher factory. So what he did was he took the tags off the individual chickens, wrapped, put them in the bags, and simply put them in the one big bag with a tag on it. Now, the average consumer isn't necessarily paying attention to, well, why aren't the chickens individually tagged? Because you see the big tag on the big bag, you know, with the six chickens in it. So he would do that, and that gave him six tags. And so for every six tags that he had, he would take six non-kosher chickens, put them into a big bag, and tag the bag. Then sell them at kosher prices, which, which, which is about four to six times the price. Good. It's a good business. Eventually, one of the non-Jewish workers from his non-kosher uh, establishment came to the head of the kosher's department. And he said, I, 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 my conscience bothers me. i got to tell you what's going on. All right, so I don't know. The end of the, I heard two versions of the end of the story. They filed a class action suit against the guy. Uh, there's one ver according to one version, he got hit with a $250,000 fine. And the other one was that they closed down his factory. So I don't know which one actually happened. People had a kosher in their kitchens. People were eating his chickens for six months. They had a kosher in their kitchen, kitchens all over the place. Because they, they didn't know. It's a great, why would a guy want to do it? Because it costs more, that's why. And part of that cost is koshering it. That's part of the labor that you're paying for. So, so when we pay for more, that's sort of now. Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman, you've heard of Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman? So Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman was the Chofetz Chaim's Talmud, who was eventually killed by the U Ukrainian nationals. Uh, and he was one of the great leaders pre-war Europe. So Rabbi Hanan Wasserman, in one of his forum, he asked a very interesting question. All through Jewish history, there have been blood libels. There have been blood libels. I think the most recent one, I think as recent as, there was one in Russia as recent as the 70s, a blood libel. What was the nature of a blood libel? You're using Goyish kids' blood for matzah. Goyish kids' blood for matzah. <laughs> now, I mean, now, now stop and think. Jews aren't murderers. Jews don't use blood, and those don't put anything in matzah of all things. Mm -hmm. So if you told me they're using the Goyish kids' blood for chalt, <laughs> okay, you know, a lot of stuff goes into the chalt. It's got a nice kind of a brownish, reddish color to it, you know. You know, some of those potatoes look well. You know, all right, uh, maybe I, I chalt, you know, I'm missing my wallet probably in the chalt. You know, I, who knows? <laughs> who knows what's being put? Who knows what's being put in chalt? Chalt, you know, you, you, chalt has even become a, a, you know what the word chalt means actually? It's a French word. The French word cholent. The, the reason why people ate cholent is actually dates back to about the 1500s. First of all, we eat cholent because it tastes good. Okay, number two, because the Torah says you're not allowed to burn a fire on Shabbos. But you can use an existing fire, something that was sitting on the fire. The Karaites came along. The Karaites only took the written Torah. They would rejected the oral Torah. They would refuse to eat cholent on Shabbos. They said the Torah says no fire on Shabbos. So much so that anyone in the Middle Ages, I don't know exactly what century, if a person did not have a hot dish on Shabbos, they were suspected of being a Karite. They were suspected, yeah, now you don't have to have cholent the way we make it. It doesn't have to be potatoes, be meat, and beans. Uh, you, could have, you could put kugel on the thing and eat a hot kugel and eat something hot. Whatever you want. It just happens to be that it tastes very good. The Karites, the Karites rejected the oral tradition, and therefore they said that you can't eat anything. So that, that's where the tradition came. So Rabbi Chanan Wasserman asked the following question. The most ridiculous thing in the world were the blood libels. The Gemara says any lie that doesn't have an, some truth in it will not, will not endure. You want to convince, you want to lie to somebody, you have to be a, what's called a good liar. You have to have a little bit of truth in there. Uh, let's say, Chaim, when you were in high school and you stole the test, you got a hold of the tests before the tests were given, right? Not you, Chas Shalom, but those who did, right? So three guys or four guys get a hold of the test. So you assign grades. You know, you get a 97, you get a 96, you get a 98. Not, it shouldn't be. Otherwise, if everybody gets the exact, the guy who took the test out of the teacher's briefcase, he gets to get 100, of course. But everybody else get a 95, a 97, because if everybody gets the exact same grade, when you're copying off somebody, don't be too exact, otherwise it looks suspicious. Right? How did the smartest guy in the class, Ann Kaplan, get exactly, get missed the exact, you know, get exactly, you know, it looks too, so you gotta, you gotta be smart about these things. So the Guar says, a, a, a lie that doesn't have any truth in it will never endure. So how did the blood libels endure? There isn't an iota of truth to it. Not an iota of truth. 
How did all through Jewish history of all the things you couldn't come up with the matzah better than put Christian children's blood in the matzah? I mean, you walk in the matzah baking factory. If you've got anything on you that they, they, they search you, we're more than in, a, in an airport security station to find out that you got nothing on you. You have put blood in the matzahs. You see, even the water that goes into the matzah has to be a certain type of water that was drawn a certain way. Can't use regular sink water. Where did they come from? They kind of nonsense. And Jews don't kill and Jews don't eat blood. Where did they come from? So Rabbi Hanan Rasserin writes, when the brothers deceived Yaakov Avido by dipping Yosef's cloak in the blood, they used blood to deceive Yaakov Avido, that unleashed the energy for blood libels for Jewish history. That's what Rabbi Hanan Rasserin writes. Probably the most famous Jewish blood libel. Do you ever hear of the Mendel Bayless trial? And Mendel Bayless was, about, where was it, about 1910, 1912? Mendel Bayless was living in, somewhere in Russia. So Mendel Bayless, Mendel Bayless uh, looked like he stepped right out of Jewish accountants magazine. <laughs> you know, he's about 5'3 with round glasses and a runny nose, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and, and they started a blood libel. Mendel Bayless killed a Christian child and put blood in the chult. Mendel Bayless, Mendel Bayless couldn't kill a butterfly. <laughs> Right? And they could, a ridiculous blood libel. Okay, so during the course, eventually they, I don't remember, I think he was guilty that they found him innocent, but during the trial, this is, what's, this is the part that stood out. During the trial, they called a character witness for him. It was the, the woman who worked in their house as the non-Jew who was a servant in the Bayless's house. So she said she was in the kitchen with Mrs. Bayless dozens of times where Mrs. Bayless would find an egg with a spot of blood on it, and she would throw out the entire egg. She would throw out the entire egg, because if it's a blood strip, you, know, you throw it out. It says, for a Jew to, to have anything to do with blood, it was, it, it's so abhorrent to us that it was complete. That was the character witness of the trial. I think they found him guilty, and then, then a short time later, they had a retrial and found him innocent. That was the famous Bayless, that was the famous Bayless trial. I remember as a little kid, I was a little kid, probably about nine, ten years old. My mother once called me into the ch into the kitchen to show me a blood a blood stripped egg, uh, uh, an egg to show me an egg that she's throwing out. So when we when we make a when a, a from woman makes anything, she always cracks the eggs into a transparent glass, looks through looks around the egg to make sure, then pours it into the recipe. You do not crack it and put it right into the right into the thing because it could have blood on it, right? When you crack it, always a transparent cup. Take a look at it, you check it from all sides, then you pour it into the thing. And if it's got blood in it, you pour, you pour out the egg. So they, that was the, the famous, so Rebbe Chonin Wasserman says, that energy, that lie that persevered for so many generations would, makes no sense whatsoever. That's a result of, uh, what do you call it? All right, tomorrow we'll start Parsha Shemini Amir Tzashem.